Well, it's good to have you here this morning. I feel like in some ways it was, I don't know if it was selfish or smart that I was like, hey, John Michael, why don't you go lead this moment with the Coskers? I just knew that I had to hold it together for a sermon afterwards. So I was like, why don't you lead us in honoring an incredible family, Um, uh, and then I will lead us through uh, what is a little bit of a tricky passage of scripture. Um, Parents, hopefully you heard this on the way in or saw the weekly email we send out or something like that. I think I can land the plane about PG, PG PG-13-ish ish um, for the day, but if you've got little ones in the room, you're watching from home, you're like, let me hit pause and, you know, get you to play video games for a while, that's fine, or you've got kids here and you're like, ooh, let's come up with a different plan, totally cool. Um... uh, because God obviously has a lot to say to us this morning, and he has a lot to say in areas that can be difficult to process. But I think you're going to find it um, helpful and ultimately encouraging where the Lord wants to lead us through his word. So as you think about that, um, I want you to think for just a minute about um, an observation that Ernest Hemingway made in a novel that he wrote called The Sun Also Rises. Um, In that book, he creates this character named Mike who ultimately goes bankrupt. And when asked, how did that happen? How did you go bankrupt? His answer is really profound. He says two ways, gradually and then suddenly, Um, which you may have heard that quote uh, before. Uh, It's gotten a lot of traction in our culture because it turns out that that observation gradually, then suddenly explains a lot more than the mechanics of bankruptcy. It actually is a pretty helpful observation about human nature. And I think we all kind of resonate with this idea that when we find ourselves in a place in life that we really don't want to be, when we find ourselves in a difficult spot in life and somebody says, well, hey, how is it that you ended up Here, how how did you land in this moment? More often than not, if you were to kind of look behind the curtain of that moment, the answer would be some version of, well, kind of like gradually, and then suddenly everything just came to the surface. That observation is certainly going to be true for our topic today, which is sexual sin. Um, I've been a pastor now for nearly 18 years, and the first seven of those I worked as a college pastor, and then I served as a teaching pastor at a young adult ministry for a lot of years. So in some ways, the first 10 years of my vocational ministry involved a lot of conversations with college students and young adults who were trying to figure out um, not only God's plan for sex, but how in the world could they follow that plan, right? Conversations with so many people who were battling an addiction to pornography or to young couples who had made repeat promises to God that they were going to stop sleeping together and they were going to honor God in that aspect of the relationship only to fail one more time. And then in more recent years, I've had the opportunity to sit with couples who were not faithful to their wedding vows, who stumbled into adultery, with people who have stumbled into some of the darkest corners of the internet where they ended up engaged in things uh, far Far darker and far more dangerous than they ever thought possible. And if you looked at the vast majority of those conversations, you realize that major moral failure is rarely premeditated. Right, like nobody schedules out adultery. Like nobody has that one time blocked on their calendar next Thursday from four to seven. That's gonna be the window where it happens, and I'm looking forward to it. I mean, every once in a while you find an example of that. But in general, when you wake up in that moment where you say, I don't have a clue how that just happened. How did I end up? Here, whatever that could look like in your life, if you peel the curtain back behind that moment, you realize you ended up there very, 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 very gradually. And then all of the sudden, some things started to happen, some temptation started to present itself, and you ended up doing some things that you never thought 
you were going to be able to do. And we all just kind of understand that. Like that just makes an instinctive sense to us. I think the problem is, the thing that we resist a little bit more, is we all believe that somehow we can afford to ignore or to manage all of the gradual components of that temptation cycle, right? We, we can exist in this world where we're like, look, man, um, I totally get it. I know that, you know, there are places in my life where I've gotten a little sloppy. Like, I get it. Like, I'm not super proud of, like, everything I watch on Netflix, and there's definitely some things in my Instagram feed that I should probably get rid of, and I know that I've gotten a little casual in that one relationship at work, and I know that I'm starting to hang around the office late just to be with him, and I'm like kind of, you know, going out of my way to go to that coffee shop, not the one like close to my office, but I'm like walking a couple extra blocks, and I'm telling everybody that I'm doing it because I want to get my steps in, but it's really because I want to see that one barista and like nothing's really going to happen. But, you know, in the middle of a tough day, it's just kind of fun to walk over there and see how she's doing and then just walk back to the office thinking about what that would be like. But then, boom, back game on. And we just think we can manage that world. We can just be like, okay, it's fine. We'll just build enough firewalls to ensure that gradually never turns the corner into suddenly, right? We, we, we kind of think that we can somehow play with fire, that we can somehow play with fire and not get burned. But the reality is that there is not a firewall thick enough that lust can't somehow burn its way through. I'm all for firewalls. I mean, don't, get me, don't get me wrong. It's great to minimize temptation and do everything you can to make life easy for yourself in this battle. But at the end of the day, you cannot afford to ignore gradual and just trust that the firewalls are going to hold everything in place together. So my goal for today is to take aim at that very specific area where we know we've gotten a little casual, we just don't think it's that big a deal, right? Today is not going to be um, an overview of everything that Jesus ever taught about sex and sexuality and marriage and all those kind of things. I just really want each one of us to think through that lens of where have you gotten too casual with gradual, right? Because I would much rather invite us to consider that question this morning as a church, then end up having coffee with you at some point this week, this month, or this year because somehow gradual got out of control and you have found yourself in a place in life that you never thought you would end up with. So we're going to get all of that out of a couple of short verses here. What we're going to see is that if we want to avoid sexual sin, we can't be casual about the gradual. We need to pay attention to what's actually going on in our hearts, as uncomfortable as that can be. And we're just going to ask three very simple questions of the text in front of us. Um, the first of which is just exactly what is Jesus saying? Because there's been a lot of confusion about these verses. A lot of weird things have been done with these verses over the years. So let's just kind of work through this together for a minute, and then we'll look at two additional questions. But verse 27, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. In this moment, Jesus is doing nothing more uh, than quoting the seventh commandment. Um, you probably realize that. You're like, yep, heard that before. What you may not realize is how shocking the seventh commandment was, thou shalt not commit adultery, how shocking that was in the Greco-Roman world. Because kind of the prevailing sexual ethic of the day uh, was that, sure, marriage is a thing, and we value marriage, but everybody knows that boys will be boys even if those boys are married, right? So the prevailing understanding of the day was like, look, if you were a guy in the ancient Near East, you could get away with almost anything you wanted sexually with one exception. You could not, it was taboo, it was forbidden to sleep with a married woman. 
that was not a standard that came from a high view of marriage or respect for her as an image bearer of God. It was actually a standard that had more to do with not offending her husband. Right, the kind of word on the street was like, "Look, she's off limits because she, you know, belongs to, goes with that guy, and you don't want to sin against that guy by sleeping with his wife. So don't you dare do that." But other than that, guys kind of do whatever. Um, it was shocking when the law of God comes in and Jewish tradition confirms that Yahweh's expectation was that both parties in a marriage would be faithful. That, that the woman would be faithful to the man and that the man would be faithful to the woman. That just sounded crazy. They were like, wait, you're, are, are, you are saying that one that guy gets, he's like a one-woman man for the rest of his life? To which the entire New Testament says, exactly. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 4, there was this expectation that as the followers of Jesus, we would be able to know how to control his own body in holiness and in honor, right? The Bible has this enormously high view of marriage, and that was like shocking for the people. Like, I can't believe it. Like, this is insane. And Jesus is like, oh, you think that's crazy? <laughs> Stick with me. Watch where we're about to go next, right? Um, not only should thou now commit adultery, but verse 28, but I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus is, by the way, not at all implying that only men struggle with lust. Again, he's almost reiterating this idea that, like, guys, you need to pay attention to this too. He's already kind of fighting back against the culture, but he's by no means implying that only men struggle with lust. That's one of the more destructive narratives floating around out there, that lust and pornography, this is like a guy problem, that girls don't struggle with that. And every single survey um, that comes out just shows year after year what a lie that is. So one of the more damaging things we can do to the women in the churches suggest that if you struggle with lust, if you struggle with pornography, if these are issues in your life that you are struggling with something that the Bible couldn't even anticipate happening, right? The last thing we want to do is heap additional shame on a conversation that is already so raw and so vulnerable. But Jesus is trying to say to all of us, men and women alike, that if you are looking at someone other than your spouse in such a way that sexual desire for them is aroused in you, you are right in the middle of that gradual descent into really serious sin. And in fact, what you are doing to that person in your own heart is already deeply problematic in the eyes of God. It's not just, hey, you're on the warning track and you need to stop before you run into the wall. It's like, no, God wants to relate to us on the heart level. God is after our hearts. And God says, look, I desire purity in your heart so that I can meet with you there. It's going to be really hard to cultivate a vibrant relationship with God in our hearts if we are perpetually giving our hearts over to thoughts, to fantasies, to images, to things that are designed to foster lust in our souls, right? Remember, we're after that moment today where you know that what you're doing is not right. You know you shouldn't be looking at it, watching it, reading it. You shouldn't be texting with that person. You shouldn't be hanging out at the office. But we all fall into the trap of believing it's not a big deal. Right? So the second question we want to talk about is, why does this matter? Right? Why do we need to pay such careful attention to what's going on inside of us. And I'm going to give you three different answers to that one. Um, the first is simply a cultural answer. I do not think it is sort of like cutting edge social commentary to say that you and I live in a world that is totally sexually out of control. 
right? And I don't even mean that, you know, by some sort of like prudish biblical standard, if that's like how you see the Bible. I mean the world is like sexually out of control by any measure of common sense. In fact, we all just sort of recognize it and are confronted with it on an almost daily basis basis. It's like culturally, by our own collective admission, we realize that things have gotten really, really, really messed up in our world. I'm thinking about the Me Too movement over the last couple of years that called attention to sexual assault, to sex sexism to so much misbehavior on the part of politicians, media personalities, pastors, business leaders, teachers, you name it. It feels like every week, every day almost, you go to a major news site and there is another story of sexual impropriety, of sexual abuse, sexual assault, sexual harassment. Parents understand this better than anybody. There's no parent that is comfortable with where our world is right now. And there's no parent that has figured out exactly how do you bring up children in a hyper-sexualized, increasingly digitized world where images are only a swipe away. And then ultimately those kids grow up and they go to college. The most recent surveys have shown that 26% of female and 7% of male undergraduates experience some form of non-consensual sexual contact during their time at school, whether that's rape or assault or just the inability to consent. Th that's not like internet, oh wow, I dug that really scandalous thing up from some uncredible corner of the internet. That data is confirmed over and over again by studies that major universities do of themselves to get a handle on campus culture. We all look at that and we're like, yeah, that is deeply problematic. That's terrifyingly problematic. But I'll, I'll just give you one more way of understanding the landscape. Maybe the, the one group of people that should be having sex don't seem like they are um, anymore. Uh, the 2021 General Social Survey um, showed that under, among married couples under the age of 60, 26% had sex once a month or less in 2021. And you're like, well, is, you know, that's just, I don't know, married people are lame and boring and, uh, you know, nobody wants to get married. And I'm like, well, you're right, fewer people are getting married. By the way, fewer people are also moving in together. Not that I'm condoning that, I'm just saying there's like no commitment out there. And we just sort of live in this world where like, the group that should be having sex isn't having it. Everybody else seems to be existing in this world of casual hookups and one-night stands and online fantasies, and the whole thing is just a mess. And I I'm not saying any of that for shock value, but I think we all get that. We know that it's not going well out there. And there's Jesus of Nazareth who's like, well, maybe we should pay a little bit more attention to what's actually happening in our heart. And we're like, no, that's just silly. Like maybe we've ignored what Jesus has been teaching for so long that we have created a huge mess on our hands and the whole world would be better off if we were a little less casual with the gradual, right? Because that suddenly, that major moment of sexual sin can come to life out of seemingly nowhere, right? There's also an anthropological answer to that question, why you should take this seriously, kind of how we're wired as human beings. This is where you got to tag in David, some of you probably would have bet that 2 Samuel 11 was going to show up at some point in the sermon where David commits adultery with Bathsheba. One evening, David got up from his bed and strolled around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing, a very beautiful woman. David sent someone to inquire about her, and he said, he's trying to be a friend, he goes, isn't that Bathsheba? daughter of Iliam and wife of Uriah the Hittite. That's Bathsheba. You know her dad and 
her husband. I think we know who that is. Why don't we come down off the roof, go back to bed? And David's like, no, I live in a world where powerful men get to do whatever they want. I live in a world where I'm operating out of exhaustion. I don't have any reserves left. David's gotten a little comfortable being the king of Israel. He always used to go lead the charge and go lead his men into battle. And now he's kind of settled into this mode of like, no, no, y'all will be fine without me. I'll just hang back here. Right? We always read this passage super clinically, like David just you know, gets out of bed, goes on the roof, and is like, boom, her, get over here. My suspicion is that David gets out of bed, and he's wandering around on the roof of the palace, and he's wrestling in his own heart. This is David. I mean, this is not a moral slouch. This is a man after God's own heart. This is the man who is going to be the, who is the king and will become this warrior poet of Israel who's going to write the Psalms. You know he's up on that roof being like, man, just get down. Get, get back to bed. Buy yourself. Get away. Get away. Don't do this. But he keeps looking. He keeps looking. And even when God in his mercy sends him a friend who goes like, man, what are don't do this. David is just operating in a place where he's so depleted, where he's worn himself down, where he's not where he's supposed to be, where he has developed this view of women as just being used for his own gratification, that against what I believe is against his own better judgment, he has that moment where he just says, man, just for tonight, send her over. And you know the end of the story. She gets pregnant, and he's terrified, and it leads to murder, and all of this stuff. And you're like, how'd that happen? It happened because there was a bunch of other things going on in David's world that he didn't want to deal with. So in the moment where opportunity came up, he just didn't have the ability to say no. Right? One of the things that Jesus teaches is that out of the heart, the mouth speaks. One of the things that the Proverbs teach is guard your heart above all else, for from it flows the wellsprings of life. Look, if you think you can create a private world of images and fantasy and thoughts and books that you like to read and websites that you like to go to, and at the end of the day, you think you can just contain that in the walls of your heart, the Bible would beg to differ and say, look, that's not how it works. Right? What's in your heart eventually finds its way to the surface. Right? And that's why we've got to pay attention to what's going on inside of our hearts. You can't build a firewall thick enough to hold back every form of lust. But there's also a theological answer, and I alluded to this earlier. Remember the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus gives us that summation? of what it looks like to live under the rule and reign of God, where Jesus gives us that picture of what it looks like to be one of his followers, where he describes what it looks like to be a Christian. Matthew 5, verse 8, he said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Part of what's at stake here is us cultivating a vibrant relationship with God. And you know, and you don't need me to tell you, that it's really hard to do that when your entire relationship with God is characterized by managing the guilt that you feel for sexual sin. Right? Yes, the gospel speaks directly to that. And the gospel reminds you that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, no matter what you have done. But it's really hard to develop a heart for what God wants you to do for his glory in this city if the majority of your relationship with God centers around managing the shame that you feel over your sexual behavior. Right? I I talk to Christians. You know what? Be more honest. I feel like there were seasons in my life, in my 20s, where the dominant note in my prayer life was repenting of sexual sin and trying to believe that God could still use somebody like me. That's all God and I talked about. I did it again. I know I promised I won't. 
I know I said I was done with the computer. I know I said I wouldn't do it. I know, I know, I know, but I did it again, and I'm such a loser. And how do I serve in the college ministry? And how am I ever going to go on staff at a church? And how, 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 how? That's all we talked about. Look, and I'm not trying to be the voice that heaps guilt and shame on top of that. I'm just trying to be the person that says, you were made for more than that. And God will meet you in that moment every single time. His mercy is new every single moment. He is not as disgusted with you as you are with yourself, but he does want something different for you. He's like, man, could we deal with this? Could we deal with this so that we could talk about what it would look like for you to leverage your life for my glory in one of the most significant cities in the world? I got all kinds of other stuff I'd love to talk to you about, but we're going to have to get past this thing before we can get to all of that. So for so many reasons, I think it would serve us well to pay attention to what some people will call our thought lives, what Jesus wants to locate in our hearts, right? And Jesus wants us to take it seriously. That's what verse 29 and 30 are designed to communicate. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Uh, Talk about a passage that has uh, created some confusion um, over the years, even among some really theologically educated people. Um, One of the early church fathers, a guy named Origen. Origen got a lot right. Unfortunately for Origen, um, when he read this passage, he decided that he needed to apply it literally and castrate himself. Um, Interesting interpretation. You're like, surely that's wrong? Yeah, it would have really helped Origen to be like in a community group, perhaps, with somebody who had read the book of Deuteronomy. Could have been a big moment in his life. Um, Deuteronomy 14, verse 1, um, prohibits any form of self-mutilation, particularly any form of self-mutilation that is designed for spiritual benefit. So I'm not saying this like I thought any of you were going to go out and apply this literally, but I want you to know that the reason is not just common sense. Yes, it's common sense, but also the God of the Bible has been really, really clear. Self-mutilation is a no-go, um, right? Many youth pastors have taken this whole idea and the fact that Jesus talks about eyes and hands and used it to make points that are well-intentioned and biblical, but probably not really what Jesus is talking about in this passage. Jesus is actually just using kind of like a favorite phrase of his. He uses the same phrase in Matthew 18 with no connection to sexual sin. This is just kind of like one of the ways Jesus tells people to take things seriously by talking about eyes, hands. In Matthew 18, he'll talk about feet. and other Gospels, he talk about feet. Um, it's his idea that, like, look, you've gotten really casual with some stuff, and, man, you're playing with fire, and I'm telling you, you would much rather deal with the small fires than be left trying to maintain, manage a wildfire when it breaks out. Right? So the last question we want to ask just really quickly is what does it look like for us to take this seriously today? Like, well, like, what are we supposed to do with it? And I think the obvious answer is to not do anything in our lives that deliberately provokes lust, that deliberately fosters lust. So it would be fantastic if all of us took just a minute this afternoon to think through, pray through um, who you're following on Facebook, who you're following on Instagram, what websites you're going to, what shows you're watching, what books you're reading, what content you are exposing you t- yourself to that you know is causing a problem in your heart and say, man, in God's mercy, I went to church on a day where his spirit was speaking clearly and said, would you just get rid of some of that stuff? Would you unsubscribe to Netflix? Would you get rid of your internet connection at home? Would you maybe be serious enough about this that you can ditch the iPhone in favor of a flip phone? Would you and your girlfriend stop going and sharing a hotel room together when you travel even though nothing? things going to happen and it always does 
Maybe you need to stop hanging out in your parents' basement alone after midnight. Maybe you know exactly what you need to do. The question is whether you're going to do it or not. Now, that's kind of the obvious one. You're like, yeah, 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 I saw that coming. And, you know, congratulations, former college pastor. You can't help yourself. Like, I get it. College students need that stuff all the time. And you can go preach a whole sermon off that. And it's absolutely fantastic. I know that you saw that part coming. Let me give you a couple more just to think through it. Number two, you got to keep this talk in the context of God's goodness. Right? Because, I mean, here's the question. We really believe that Jesus is loving, and he's good, and he's kind, right? And then he sits on the side of a hill, and he seems to lob out this teaching about our hearts that is either so extreme that it's absurd or so extreme that it's cruel, right? I mean, it's sort of like... What, what, what's he doing here? How, how is he, this Jesus doing anything more than just trying to heap guilt on people? How is this Jesus doing anything more than just trying to heap shame on top of people? There's obviously something in Jesus that feels comfortable calling us to a higher standard than the world has because Jesus understands that he intends to give us the grace via the power of his Holy Spirit to live out everything he calls us to. Right? There, there is this sense where in order for us to actually lean into what Jesus is calling us to today, we will have to admit that we cannot do it on our own power. We will have to arrive at this moment where we say, Jesus, I love your vision, but you're going to have to give me the strength. You're going to have to give me the power. You're going to have to help me sort out my own heart. And I believe that Jesus will do that. I think the last thought for today is engage a friend that you are able to talk honestly about what's happening in your heart. Right, a lot of times we see James 5.16 coming and we talk about confess our sins one to another and that seems terrifying in and of itself. But you know, confessing sin is always a reactive thing. Deeply healing, deeply beneficial. I, I encourage you to practice that. But confessing your sin always says, oops, here's what happened. Let me tell you about it. Let's apply the gospel to this situation together. Wouldn't it be amazing if you had a friend that you could talk about what's actually going on in your heart before it comes to life in such a way that you need to confess it as a sin that you have already committed? Right? Wouldn't it be amazing if you had somebody in your life that you could text after today's message and say, man, I just want you to know I'm going to be unfollowing some people on Facebook today, and I'd like you to hold me accountable to that. Man, I just want you to know nothing's happened, but there's this girl at work. Man, nothing's happened, but there's this guy at work. Hey, I, I, I just, I don't know what's happening. I just feel like I'm in a season right now where my mind and my eye is wandering all the time. Would you pray for me as my brother in Christ? Would you pray for me as my sister in Christ? I, I, I get how scary that is. I, I, I get how vulnerable that conversation is. I get you're not going to go into the lobby and meet a stranger and be like, hey, you want to try that thing? I hope you're not going to do that. Don't do that. Um, you're going to have to, like, get connected to a community group, start serving with a team, like, you know, make friends the old-fashioned way, um, and then ultimately let that conversation get deeper and deeper and deeper and say, hey, we're both running after God. We both want to meet with God in our hearts. What if we partnered together to help each other out? Look, in the moments where you end up dealing with the worst forms of sexual sin, the church should be here for you and this church will be here for you. The last thing that should ever happen as a result of a day like today is for anybody to have even a shred of doubt of whether you should be here given the sin of your past or given the sin of your last night. This is a place of grace. It's a place of mercy. It's a place of restoration. It's a place of healing. And there is nothing that you have done in your past that is so great that the cross of Jesus Christ cannot forgive you of it. And there is nothing that you have done that may, would make you unwelcome here. 
right? So there is this grace. But as anybody who's been in that moment of profound sin would tell you, you also don't want to get to that place where you need to receive that kind of grace. Everybody that's ever fallen into the pit of adultery, everybody who's ever fallen into a place where they had to end a relationship because they just couldn't keep it honoring to God. Anybody who's ever been to that place that would stand up here and say, man, I know it's basic, but would you pay attention to what God is saying today? Because you would much rather get ahead of the curve than have to manage this moment of incredible failure. So our team is going to come and lead us in one last song. Just a time for us to be reminded of the goodness of God, for us to be reminded of the beauty of God, for us to be reminded of this God that we want to meet in our heart, this one that we're, we're cultivating a pure heart for. But as they get ready to come out and lead us, I want to take a minute to pray. Father, I want to ask for your grace in my life. I want to ask for your grace in the lives of the elders and leaders of this church. Scripture warns, take heed lest you fall. God, I pray for any person here who believes that they are too old, too above, too beyond, somehow not needing to hear the loving warning of your scripture. Would you help us to humble ourselves this morning and admit that we need you, admit that we need community, Admit that our hearts are prone to wander. Lord Jesus, I pray for the people who are considering specific changes that they need to make today. God, I'm asking that in this moment, if there are changes you are leading people to make, that you would make that crystal clear to them. that you would just be speaking into hearts, and lives, and minds right now. Not only telling sons and daughters what it is that you would have them do, but also assuring them that you will give them the grace to do. And Lord Jesus, I do pray for those who have had trouble hearing this today because the voice of condemnation has been loud in their heart. Just remind them of the grace of the gospel, of your love, of your faithfulness. Lord, help us to honor.